What does it mean to be desperate? I'm not talking about your team is down at halftime and it's the Super Bowl. I'm talking about really desperate. Those times when you say, oh God, and it's not taking the Lord's name in vain. Have you ever been in those moments? Have you ever begged for the life of a loved one while they're on the operating table? Maybe you begged for your marriage when you just don't see how it's going to keep going tomorrow. Maybe you push back from something disgusting and just ask God to deliver you from this sin that just seems to have a hold on your heart. Truly desperate. What does it mean to be desperate? Why does God take us to these places of desperation? We're going to see the story in Mark, which we're going to open up in just a minute, of a man that was truly desperate. And I think if we see the story and as we look back into our own lives, we find that in these moments of desperation, it's like coming face to face with this mirror. And we look into this mirror and we see ourselves as completely incapable, completely unable to resolve this issue. And as we look into this mirror of desperation, we actually find out it's not a mirror, but it's the highly polished altar to a God who is completely capable in these moments of desperation, we find our own inability meets God's complete ability, and we know somehow instinctively that it's to God we must cry to help. In this story, we're going to read a leper or a man afflicted with leprosy, which may not have necessarily been leprosy, but it would have been something horrible that overtook his life and over his body. We don't really have leprosy in our lives, but if you can remember maybe a few years back, the stories of flesh-eating bacteria were all over the news. Remember that? It was like, don't go swimming in the lakes anymore. You might catch flesh-eating bacteria. And it's horrible, right? It turns your body into this disease, decaying, like, still-living corpse. It's gross. Don't Google image flesh-eating bacteria. <laughs> if you can imagine, though, this was this man's life. And not only did he deal with the pain and the sores, trouble sleeping, but the Jewish law says that he had to be cut off from his people, banished outside of town. He could no longer worship with the people of God. He could no longer even hug his family. If he had children, they were cut off from him. It's said that as he walked along the streets, in Leviticus it tells him he must cover up his upper lip and shout, unclean, unclean, so that they would know to stay away from him. Can you imagine you just walking down the road and you, you, know, you see a little beautiful girl and you, you want to smile at her, but she sees you in terror, just covers her face. She's disgusted. And little boys who you'd love to just kind of play with and say, hey, how's it going? Shake their hair. You know, they, they call you nasty names. I don't imagine that time made that more okay. I imagine that after a while his heart was as raw as his skin was. But then he... Here's a story of a name of a man who's been going around doing impossible things. So what does he do with this impossible situation? He takes it to a God who specializes in the impossible. It's his last hope. He rolls the dice, except he doesn't leave it to chance. He leaves it to God. So turn with me to Mark chapter 1. We're going to go through verse 40 through 45. And we're going to see how we should go to God when we're desperate because these desperate times will come and we need to know what it is should be in our hearts and in our approach. Mark chapter 1 verse 40 says, Now a leper came to him, Jesus, and fell to his knees asking for help. If you are willing, you can make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing, be clean. The leprosy left him at once, and he was clean. Immediately, Jesus sent the man away with a very strong warning. He told him, See that you do not say anything to anyone, but go, show yourself to a priest, and bring the offering that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But as the man went out, he began to announce it publicly and spread the story widely so that Jesus was no longer able to enter any town openly, but stayed 
in remote places. And so there's three things I want us to see from this story. First of all, in looking at the leper, that we can approach Jesus humbly. Second, that we can trust in his ability and willingness to deliver us. And third, that we must respond to our deliverance with obedience. But this first thing I do want us to notice is that we can go to Jesus humbly. Humbly but boldly. Notice he says he came to him and fell to his knees asking for help. We don't come to just any source of authority on our knees, right? We don't go to our boss and ask for you know a lunch break. Can I go to my, to my lunch break, boss? I mean, that would be a little bit funny, but do notice we do go to our knees to propose marriage, don't we? What does it show to be on your knees? It shows a submission. It shows an honor. Right? It shows, like, you have my destiny in your hands. When you pop that question, you know, you put the ring in your hand, you're on your knees. What you say next is my destiny. Complete submission. And God says we can humbly approach him like that. Hebrews tells us that uh, we can actually boldly approach the throne of grace, right? So not only do we come with humility, but it's a bold kind of humility. We boldly approach the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy right, and find grace in times of need. God wants us to come to him in times of need, just like this leper does. We have to. And God, I think, often does put these hardships in our lives because it puts us in that position on our knees, doesn't it? It puts us in this realization that we need God, that we are unable without him. I think of the opening of 2 Corinthians when Paul says that we felt like we were in such a bad spot that we had the sentence of death on us, but that was so we would learn to rely on God that raises the dead. Right? Because a death sentence is nothing serve a God that raises the dead. He puts us in these impossible situations so that he can deliver us and to teach us to be humble in the doing. The second thing when we encounter hardships and we seek God is that we must look at him trusting that he is willing and able to deliver us. Notice the way he puts it. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He doesn't it doesn't like just come up and ask him, hey, can you clean me up? Can you fix me? He says that your omnipotence is limited only by your will. It's this statement of just sovereignty, this submissive respect. But it's also this trust. If, it's, if you're willing, you're able. Right? There's just a, just a strong connection. If you're willing, you're able. And so he trusts God. It's not a... Do you think you could see this out for me? Do you think you could work something out? It's all you gotta do is decide. And what? If it's beautiful, God, God does, right? He says, I am willing, be clean, and all he has to do is speak it, and it happens. He spoke the universe into being. When he tells you to be clean, you're clean. There's no argument from nature or our own souls for that matter. I am willing, be clean. If it depends then on his will, it doesn't really depend on us earning a rescue. So when we go to God, we trust that it's based on his ability. Not, well, he is able. We trust that he's able. It's based on his willingness, and it's not about us earning it. I love the passage in 2 Peter that says, If God rescued Noah and Lot, then he knows how to rescue the, the godly, right? And I love this, and I think this is particularly powerful for those in ministry. Think about Noah and Lot, right? By our standards, they had terribly, horrifically horrible failures of ministry. Noah preached for a hundred years and not a single convert. Right? Lot was in um, Sodom for de decades and he didn't even win his own wife over. I mean, even after they got rescued, they got terribly drunk afterwards. God knew they were going to do that. They didn't earn a rescue. And I think for us, you know, when we're in ministry, uh, we're going to ask ourselves, should I have done this better? God, can you rescue this? It doesn't depend on us. I had a church plant fail, one of the most painful things in my life. And, of course, the years after, we were asking ourselves, what if, what if, what if? Um, what if we'd done this differently? And, and, and my mentor at the time said something really powerful to me. He said, Mike, if Jesus had wanted that church to continue, you couldn't have screwed up enough to make that happen, not happen. Right? In 
ministry, we can trust that it's about God's ability and willingness and not our own earning a rescue or in anything that we're in life. Finally, we notice that we must respond to that deliverance with obedience. And here's where the story of the leper, he's no longer a role model in this. I would love to get him off the hook uh, and try to say, well, maybe he uh, got, Jesus didn't really expect him to keep not telling anybody. You know, God doesn't give commands he doesn't expect us to follow, and that doesn't get us off the hook. Um, if you look at it, he says, he sternly warned him, but, you know, but he went out. All six major translations say either however or but. Uh, there's no and there. So it says that he went out and began to announce it publicly and spread the story. And this isn't just him, well, uh, I was just answering questions about what happened to me. The Greek is caruso, that's to proclaim. He went out preaching. So many times we go out thinking we're doing good, but in the end we're building our kingdom and not God's kingdom. So many times in ministry we'll be faced with good ideas, but we need to stop and ask ourselves, God, what is it you want? Okay? What is it you want? Because if you'll notice, he actually hurts Jesus' ministry through his proclamation. A right thing done in a wrong way is wrong no matter how good it seems to us. <laughs> and you see that even though this man was delivered, even though you expect him to have some sort of appreciation for what just happened, he's so like his father, Adam. The one thing he says not to do, what does he go do? And we're the same way, if we're honest. So we must be careful to hold on to these memories of our deliverance and respond with obedience. So if I could put it another way, what areas of your life are you holding out on obedience to? Do you stop and consider the ways that God's delivered you and trust to follow his way instead of what seems right to you? Because I'll admit there's lots of things that I encounter in life that are problems that maybe I don't even ask God, how do you want me to solve this or, or seek to ask him for any kind of guidance? My in-laws have a saying which I've adopted. It's as if uh, if money can solve the problem, it's not really a problem. And I, I like that because it puts things into perspective, you know, what real problems are. But I think sometimes I probably fall into the trap of, well, if it can easily solve my money, I'm just going to write the check. And do I even pray about it? Do I even thank God later? Thank you for your provision to this in advance? i got to be honest and check my own heart on that. And I hope that in the next hardships I face, I, I do go with better clarity in what God's will is and more prayerfulness. So, why is it that God gives us these issues in life? It's to better see who he is, right? And to rightly see who we are. We are utterly unable without his help. In times of hardship, we need to approach him humbly. Approach that throne of grace. Trust in his ability to deliver us but also with the heart of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We trust that God will deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will, but if he doesn't, we're still not going to worship false idols. Right? And we're not, we're not naming proclaiming crowds in here, I trust. We must be confident in a God that does his will, does all that he pleases, as Psalm 115 says. Because while we do humbly go to the throne of grace, we remember that it's not our throne we sit on. And finally, that we respond to deliverance with obedience. I pray that as we go out and face our hardships and teach others to suffer well, that we remember these things. Thank you.